At Making Medicine, we're reporting on the headlines, not making medical recommendations. For personal health questions, always consult a doctor. Nothing in this episode constitutes investment, financial, or legal advice, and please consult your own advisors before making decisions. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Medicine podcast, where science, policy, and innovation meet. As always, I'm your host, John Stanford. This week, we're covering yesterday's Senate help hearing on the future of biotech. We're talking about the latest drug pricing announcement from the White House that's happening as we record. We'll take a look at Incubate Policy Lab's latest release and a sneak peek at our end of year investment analysis. It's a lot to get through, so let's get right into the show. Even with the government shut down, the Senate is still taking actions that are relevant, including a Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee hearing held Wednesday, right around the time of recording, on an important topic, quote, the future of biotech, maintaining U.S. competitiveness and delivering life-saving cures to patients. Certainly something we talk about here a lot on Making Medicine. Here are some of our top takeaways coming out of the hearing. The first one has to be China, and that China's closing fast. Multiple witnesses warned U.S. biotech leadership could flip to China in the next few years without a coherent national strategy out of the United States. China is investing heavily in R&D, clinical trials, and manufacturing. And while IP theft remains a risk that demands stronger protection and enforcement, there's also a lot of innovation coming out of China. More on China in a moment. But we also saw conversations that competitiveness will require speed and certainty. FDA modernization through clearer endpoints, biomarkers, AI-enabled reviews, adequate staffing, and vacancy backfilling was a bipartisan theme. Delays widen the so-called valley of death for small companies that drive so much of the innovation ultimately acquired by large manufacturers. We also heard points that we need to protect IP at home and abroad. Witnesses flagged both foreign espionage, especially from China, as mentioned, as well as domestic policy proposals that weaken patents as threats to investment and pipeline. Shout out to last week's celebration of National IP Month and Joshua Kresh, our guest, for more conversation about those IP topics. The drug pricing debate dominated a lot of the conversation throughout the hearing. Claims by witnesses that the IRA price negotiations have no impact were challenged by facts and concerns that investment capital flight, longer timelines, and shifting priorities are changing drug development. Incubate and the Making Medicine podcast have made clear that the effects of things like the pill penalty is very real. And so it's critically important that we address some of these misconceptions, even ones made in the congressional record. We were very disappointed to see a number of witnesses patently ignoring clear data that says the IRA and the small molecule penalty are having negative effects for biotech and investors. Also coming up was the NIH and the FDA as strategic assets, but cuts, layoffs, and grant cancellations are tied to trial disruptions in the short term, and we can talk about fewer breakthroughs five to 10 years out. Witnesses agree that stable multi-year funding is an economic and national security policy, not just a scientific policy. And so it seemed like there remained consensus. It's important to remember that despite all the talk about cuts to the NIH, there is bipartisan consensus on the budgeting side. Most of the president's cut to NIH was rejected by Republicans and Democrats alike. Another takeaway is that domestic manufacturing needs predictable pathways. The FDA, quote, pre-check concept and more frequent agency interaction could de-risk U.S. facility buildouts, but capital intensity and regulatory uncertainty still push production overseas. This will be an area of ongoing interest both to incubate and to the massive manufacturer commitments to the tunes of tens of billions of dollars to construct in the U.S. It wouldn't be a congressional hearing without mentions of PBMs, and witnesses on both sides push that PBM consolidation continues to cause access problems. Senators, in particular, highlighted pharmacy deserts and vertical integration, linking PBM dominance to worse access and misaligned incentives. This hearing will strengthen the case for PBM reform to lower costs and expand patient access. While not necessarily the focus of the hearing, we are seeing with more direct-to-patient conversation a real exposure of just how much cost PBMs were taking out of the system. 
The difference between a direct-to-patient cost and the cost we talk about in terms of net price can largely be attributed to PBMs. Bottom line, there's urgency to keep innovation in the U.S. The committee repeatedly tied leadership, investment, and policy stability to tangible outcomes, including faster trials, more starts, and sustained pipelines to bring new treatments to patients. While we'll cover some other elements of the hearing, We'll close with one notable exchange between Senator Andy Kim, Democrat of New Jersey, and John Crowley, the CEO of Bio. Senator Kim asked if the U.S. right now is the leading country in the world, and John responded that yes, we are the leader, but that China is a rising competitive threat. Kim continued asking, what about in 10 to 20 years? And this is the quote that stood out to me. No, not at all. In fact, it's a lot sooner than that. If you look at the National Security Commission report on emerging biotechnology, They have 49 recommendations to strengthen, maintain, and advance our lead in biotechnology, but we need to act boldly and we need to act today. Uh, We believe within two to three years, we can lose this. Dangling modifiers aside, the CEO of Bio, a critical partner to incubate and a leading voice in this conversation, is making clear that this is not a 10 or 20 year problem. This is a two to three year problem. At Incubate, we completely agree. And that's why this morning, we released a new report that looks deeper at why China is giving biotech the green light within its borders, and the U.S. seems to be putting red lights up, stopping the innovation that we do at home. In the Senate help hearing, Chair Cassidy shared in his opening remarks that in many recent conversations with biotech executives and stakeholders, that China has been seen as a collaborator, a competitor, and a threat. In Incubate's own conversations with his office, we completely agree Other senators and witnesses also uniformly recognize China's commitment to establishing itself as a biotech leader. As mentioned, John Crowley from Bio said we could lose our leadership in biopharmaceutical development in as little as two to three years. What's our perspective here at Incubate? We recognize China's growing role in the biotech industry, and we believe the U.S. must similarly focus on establishing policies that will allow innovators, investors, and patients to benefit from our leadership in the biotech industry. Our concern, however, is that recent and proposed policies have instead weakened our leadership, and without a committed effort to it, we might eventually cede it altogether. So our policy lab team have put together a one-pager, that's Washington speak for something that's supposed to capture attention, but also be quick to get through, that highlights some key policy roadblocks we're seeing, that from our view, give US-based biotech a red light, while on the very same policies, Chinese companies are seeing green lights from their government to innovate at home. Our analysis looked at three areas, regulatory outlook, intellectual property, and how we value innovation. On the Chinese side under regulatory outlook, investment in R&D, talent, and capacity is a green light. There's a commitment to fund labs and modernize facilities. There's even focus on specific novel technologies like CAR T cell therapies. Whereas in the U.S., we gave it a red light. FDA and NIH upheaval and slower capital movement caused by leadership churn, shifting priorities, and staffing constraints at our key agencies add review friction and planning risk that stretches timelines, which chills early-stage innovation. In short, prolonged uncertainty leads to fewer new trials and ultimately new medicines. On the intellectual property side, changes over the last decades mean that Chinese entities have seen a 720% increase in biotech patents. That's not a typo. It's a seven-fold increase in innovation. Whereas here in the U.S., on both sides of the aisle, we've seen proposals for policies around margin rights that would weaken patent certainty and proposed patent taxes erode confidence and a return on R&D investment. Again, a green light in IP from China, long an antagonist for much IP around the world, and a red light potentially here at home. And finally, on valuing innovation, there's a faster approval and review process, whereas in the US, we gave it a red light because drug pricing headwinds, like the most favored nations, as well as the tailwinds from the Inflation Reduction Act, mean that both of these effective price controls are saying that we as a country value innovation less. That has to be addressed. So what do we do to change that? From our perspective, the solution is straightforward restore predictability and pricing policy by avoiding MFN-styled prices and pursue reforms that lower out-of-pocket costs. 
that can have success for patients and the economy without chilling early stage investment. Let's reinforce IP certainty. We shouldn't be talking about march in and patent tax experimentation. And finally, let's give clarity to our agencies that are so critical to the development of new drugs. The FDA and NIH need to be able to offer predictable, timely reviews of medicine. American innovation is at a crossroads. Over the last decade, China paired long horizon investment with faster reviews and clearer market pathways, while the US has brought about uncertainty on pricing, IP, and regulation. It's critically important when we talk about China, however, that we don't dream up fanciful barriers. It's simply ludicrous to believe that we will cage China in on their desire to be a meaningful force in the biotech community. We can't build a great wall around their biotech innovation. Our isolationist policies that have been proposed to date that might reduce our ability to invest in their innovation will not in any way deter or slow China's advancement here. So it's important that we ask what can we do to make ourselves more competitive and not what can we do to make them less competitive. As Max Baer from Endpoints raised on one of our recent podcasts, there'd be an ethical concern by saying we want to slow innovation for others. But there are national security and economic imperatives that say it would be better for America to remain dominant in this space. So let's pursue policies that will allow that dominance to remain. The choice now is whether we remove the red lights or watch the green lights glow somewhere else. I don't often mention the incredible production team that goes into making each episode of Making Medicine. They have a difficult timeline when we record usually on Wednesdays to post on Thursdays. And sometimes that means news is breaking as we're recording. So we're gonna do our best to cover the White House announcement from what we know based on preliminary calls and background sources. And we'll be sure to cover anything else we left out on next week's episode. At the time of recording, our healthcare leadership, HHS Secretary RFK Jr., CMS Administrator Dr. Oz, and FDA Commissioner Marty Makari are at HHS making announcement right now about biosimilars. They're announcing a push to streamline regulatory pathways for biosimilars with a key change under review, waiving or reducing clinical efficacy and switching studies that have previously delayed biosimilar approvals. For those who follow biosimilars, this has always plagued the ability to bring them to market faster. The idea here is to treat certain biosimilars more like generic small molecule drugs, which would lower cost and speed market entry. The regulatory distinction between biosimilar versus interchangeable is being challenged, but there's growing momentum to deem many biosimilars automatically interchangeable without extra testing. This has a strategic significance. In the broader healthcare price pressure landscape, the move signals that the FDA is willing to re-examine long-standing regulatory burdens to spur innovation and affordability. I think on this one, however, it's certainly affordability and competition that are winning the day. There are a lot of scientists, far smarter than I am, who can debate whether interchangeability for biosimilars is entirely appropriate. But this announcement from the White House and from the FDA and HHS make clear that they want to see biosimilars come to market much faster. What seems to be a recurring theme of some of our episodes is a cell and gene therapy update because there was additional news. Senator Cassidy in the hearing noted that more than 30 cell and gene therapies have been approved by the FDA. However, as we covered recently, market dynamics continue to make that difficult. Notably, Biomarin announced it will be exploring ways to divest its hemophilia A gene therapy, Roctavian, only two years after it received approval. Galapagos announced it's winding down its cell therapy division after it couldn't find viable proposals from a buyer. It continues a string of bad news that we've been covering here, and it's mainly tied to the reality that we haven't put forward good reimbursement policy that gives clarity to how we as a country are going to treat these medicines. There is, of course, promise scientifically. And ARPA-H, the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, recently funded seven different companies to continue development of in vivo therapies. Starna Therapeutics, a Chinese biotech, announced that it's raised money to look at promising clinical data treating lupus and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So once again, China resurfaces in this conversation where they have a stated preference 
to advance and become a leader in CAR-T therapies at a time when American companies are struggling to make them economically viable. This will be something we keep watching. Those announcements are a good segue into our September investment trends and a sneak peek at what will be our end of year investment analysis. Earlier this year, the Incubate team began tracking investments across the early stage life science industry to better understand where capital is deploying. Through the first nine months of the year, we've seen more than $14 billion invested. We've seen a rise in investment in companies utilizing AI in their drug development throughout the year. Most recently, that included an $150 million Series D raised by Boulder, Colorado-based Inveda, which is utilizing AI to boost nature-based drug discovery. That's one of a handful of AI companies that seem to be attracting a lot of capital for their progress in leveraging the AI everyone is talking about in drug development. That's just one of the September deals we saw, which had more than 100 investments across the early stage ecosystem for about $2.8 billion. The top districts in September, the California 11th, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi's district received eight investments of more than 160 million. Rep. Catherine Clark from the Massachusetts 5th had seven investments for a staggering 409 million. And just down the road in Massachusetts, Representative Ayanna Presley had six investments for $42 million. It'll be no surprise that the two top states were California with just shy of 900 million and Massachusetts with 783 million. Notably, Texas had 424 million. These are the kinds of analytics that you can be on the lookout for for our end of year report, which we'll be releasing in early January. I'm glad we mentioned releasing that in early January because we did have a couple questions this week from listeners. The first was asked very pointedly if Incubate would be doing their policy event at JPM 2026. Yes, the Incubate team will be in San Francisco for JPM week and will be hosting our policy breakfast on January 12th from 8.30 to 10.30. Send us a DM on LinkedIn to be added to the invite list. The other question we had asked what's going on at the FDA during the government shutdown. They felt like there wasn't enough detail in last week's episode. Biospace recently had an article that Incubate contributed to that talked about what 28 days into a shutdown looks like. There seems to be continuing operations, but companies are beginning to complain about delays or slowed communication. Viking Therapeutics CEO reported on potential delays ahead of a phase two meeting due to the slowdown. The FDA, which partly uses user fees outside of appropriations, continues to cover a lot of its work, but with new applications halted, user fee revenue is not flowing. Some work continues because the FDA is using carryover funds, which gives it a buffer about four to eight weeks of operations without new income. Well, that four weeks is up, so we'll continue to watch and you can read more from Biospace's great article about where the FDA stands amid the shutdown. That's all for this week's episode of the Making Medicine Podcast. Have a thought or question about today's topics? Drop a comment and we'll feature it in next week's episode just like we did in this episode. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn, X, and Instagram using the links in the description. Thanks for listening. And as always, keep innovating.